So now we know what the structure of ATP synthase is, complex 5 of the electron transport chain, let's actually discuss the mechanism of how ATP synthase carries out its function. So remember, the function of ATP synthase complex 5 is to actually use that proton motive force, the proton electrochemical gradient established by complexes 1, 3, and 4 to actually generate the high energy ATP molecules. And so what I'd like to focus on in this lecture and the next lecture is how the ATP synthase actually carries out its function, the mechanism of its function. Now in this lecture, I'd like to focus on the catalytic subunit, the catalytic structure of ATP synthase. So remember in our previous discussion of the structure of ATP synthase, we said that ATP synthase can actually be broken down into two regions. One of the regions is found in the actual inner membrane of the mitochondria, this region here. And this is known as the F0 region. And the F0 region actually contains that proton channel that rotates. And we'll talk about that in much more detail in the next lecture. In this lecture, I'd like to focus on the other region, the F1 region, because it's the F1 region that contains the catalytic structure. The catalytic structure is known as the alpha-3, beta-3 hexamer ring. So the F1 region of ATP synthase contains that hexamer ring, the alpha-3, beta-3 structure that actually catalyzes the formation of ATP molecules and, this, and it does this in three different steps. So in step one, it basically binds the reactants, the ADP molecules and the inorganic orthophosphate molecules. In step two, it actually catalyzes their combination to form the product molecule, the ATP. And in step number three, the ATP is actually released into the matrix of the mitochondria. Now, I have to emphasize the following important point. So this hexamer structure, this hexamer structure here can actually carry out each one of these steps. But step one and two can take place in the absence or in the presence of the proton motive force. So what that means is step one and two can be carried out in the absence or presence of that proton electrochemical gradient. So step one and two can take place regardless of whether or not we actually have this F0 region present within ATP synthase. So regardless of whether or not we have that proton electrochemical electrochemical gradient, the hexamer, can bind the ADP and orthophosphates and can actually convert them into ATP. But for the ATP synthase to actually be able to release the synthesized ATP molecule, there has to be a proton electrochemical gradient that must exist between the two sides of the inner membrane of the mitochondria because only when the F0 structure actually rotates, when the C ring rotates, will the gamma ring, will the gamma structure rotate, and only then will that structure be able to actually release the ATP molecule. And we'll talk about that in much more detail in the next lecture. So let's take a look at the following structure. So this is our alpha-3, beta-3 hexamer ring, and let's take a cross-section of that structure and examine it from top to bottom. This is basically what we're going to see. So we have our three alpha units. So we have alpha unit here, alpha unit here, and alpha unit here. And we have our beta units. The beta unit here, beta unit here, and beta unit here. <coughs> so. <clears throat> Let's begin by focusing on these alpha subunits. Now, the alpha subunits, even though they're part of the hexamer ring, they don't actually play a catalytic role. And even though these alpha units can in fact bind ATP molecules and they will have ATP molecules bound to them, they will not actually release the ATP molecules nor will they carry out any useful process. So, Although the alpha subunits of the hexamer ring do contain ATP molecules bound to them, they do not release these ATP molecules, nor will they actually carry out or participate in some reaction, some useful reaction. On the other hand, <coughs> 
the beta subunits actually are the ones that will play that catalytic role. They have the ability to actually undergo these three reactions. They are the ones that bind the ADP and orthophosphate reactants. They're the ones that catalyze the synthesis of the ATP and they're the ones that release that ATP molecules once a rotation actually takes place as we'll see more detail in just a moment. In fact, Notice that we have three different conformations, that is, the beta subunits can actually exist in one of three different states. And that's because we have three different reactions that have to be carry, uh, carried out by this alpha-3, beta-3 hexamer. So we have the 10 state, or simply the T state, we have the loose state, or simply the L state, and we have the open state, or simply the O state. Now, in the open state, in the open state, once the ATP molecule is formed, only when that beta subunit is in the open state can the ATP molecule be released from that beta subunit. And likewise, only in the open state can the subunit actually bind the ADP and orthophosphate reactants. Now, in the loose state, it actually has the ADP and the orthophosphate bound to it, but because in the loose state, they're not broad uh, the, the reactants are not brought close enough, they will not be able to react to form the ATP molecules. But in the 10th state, the structure is constrained and the ADP and the orthophosphate are brought close enough to actually synthesize that ATP molecules. And I have to emphasize the following important point. In the tense state or in the loose state, these two states will not release the ATP molecules or the ADP and orthophosphate molecules. They're only released in the open conformation. So we see that the beta subunit, however, unlike the alpha subunit, can actually bind the ADP and orthophosphate reactants, synthesize the ATP, and release the ATP into the matrix. And at any given moment in time, the beta subunits can exist in one of three distinct states. We have the 10th state in which the ADP and orthophosphate are brought close so that they can be combined to form that ATP molecule. And once the ATP is formed, only once the subunit is in the open state can the ATP actually be released from that structure. Now, in the loose state, the bound ADP and orthophosphate become trapped, but they're not close enough to actually relax, or, or, or react and form the ATP. So, these are the three states. Now, the next question is, what determines the actual state of that particular subunit? So, let's take a look at the following diagram. So, what we see happening in the following diagram is, as we go, for, for instance, from this particular structure to this particular structure, the actual alpha-3, beta-3 hexamer ring does not rotate, but this middle portion, the gamma structure shown in red, actually rotates. So remember, as we discussed previously, it's this gamma structure that actually rotates as a result of the rotation of the C ring, as we'll see in the next lecture, that causes a change in conformation of the beta subunit. So this is what we see in this diagram. So to see what we mean, let's begin with this diagram, which is basically this diagram here. And notice I've omitted the ATP molecules in the alpha subunits because the alpha subunits don't participate in this catalysis reaction. Only the beta units do. And so in this particular conformation, this particular beta subunit exists in the 10 state, this exists in the loose state, and this exists in the open state. Now, only in the 10th state are the ADP and orthophosphate molecules brought close enough for them to actually react and form the ATP. And so we see that there is an equilibrium that exists between the reactants and the products. But once this C structure actually rotates, will this structure actually rotates? So this, remember, is that gamma structure that creates that central stalk that basically moves through the central cavity of that hexamer ring. And so this is what we see here. And so 
if that central stalk, that gamma unit actually rotates, let's say 120 degrees in the counterclockwise direction so that this pointer, instead of pointing here, basically moves 120 degrees in this direction, it will now point, the arrow, the pointer here, will point here. And what that means is, this will no longer exist in the 10th state, this will exist in the 10th state. But this will no longer exist in the open state, this will exist in the loose state. So all of these beta subunits basically switch their conformations, their states. This will now exist in the open, this will now exist in the 10th, and this one will exist in the loose. And so once we synthesize the ATP, once this rotation takes place, only then will the ATP will actually be able to leave this, uh, this structure here. So once this rotation takes place, this is in the open state, and in the next process, step two, this ATP molecule will be released from this structure and will travel into the matrix of the mitochondria. While when this goes from the loose state to the 10th state, these two reactants are brought close enough for them to begin producing the ATP molecules. And this structure in the open state, these reactants can easily leave and enter the, this structure, but once this conformational change takes place and we enter the loose state, these two reactants are now trapped in this conformation. But even though they're trapped, they're not close enough to actually carry out that catalysis reaction and transform them into ATP molecules. So once we go from this structure to this structure, the ATP molecule actually leaves and now we have this empty spot. And so in the final step, what happens is once the ATP leaves, the ADP and the orthophosphate can actually enter this location and the cycle can basically repeat itself again. So we see that the rotation of the gamma subunit that basically lies within the inner cavity of the hexamer ring basically allows the interconversion of the beta subunits from one state to another state. And notice that at any given moment in time, all the beta subunits exist in a particular distinct state. And that implies that any given two subunits, two beta subunits, will never exist in the same identical state. So we have three of these different subunits and they exist in different states. And that's a, a, and that's a result of the orientation of this central gamma structure that exists be, uh, um, in the central cavity of that hexamer ring. So once again, let's summarize the following diagram. And this entire mechanism by which this takes place is known as the binding change mechanism. So in reaction one, a rotation of the gamma subunit of 120 degrees in a counterclockwise direction, so when this arrow basically moves here, 120 degrees, what happens is, this structure here in the 10th state changes into the open conformation, the open state. So we see the rotation basically converts the beta subunit in the 10th state into the open state and the other units are also transformed. So this one becomes the 10th and this one which was open becomes loose. Now this relaxes the beta subunit and now that ATP that was synthesized in the 10th state can be released in process 2. So in process 2, the ATP is actually released. And in process 3, once the ATP is released, a new set of ADP orthophosphate will enter that open beta subunit. And once they enter, if we have another rotation, so if this structure rotates 120 degrees again this way, then this open will become a loose state. And once in a loose state, these two reactants will become trapped within this beta subunit. So another rotation of 120 degrees in a counterclockwise direction, which is not shown in this diagram, will lock the reactants, the ADP and the PI, in this state, and they will not be able to leave this structure. And so this mechanism is what we call the binding change mechanism.
Now, what we're going to focus on in the next lecture is how the third step actually takes place. So we actually didn't discuss why the ATP molecule is actually able to leave. Because what ultimately allows that ATP molecule to actually leave is the fact that this structure is in the open state. And what creates that open state is the rotation of that gamma unit. In the next lecture, we're going to focus on what causes that gamma unit to actually rotate. We're going to discuss the rotation of the C-ring in the F-naught region of the ATP synthase molecule.